Take your guitar playing to the next level with these concepts on chord voicings coming up next in this episode. Chord voicings, it's how we spell our chords and how they sound when we present and play them. A telltale sign of an amateur guitarist is how they is are some deficiencies, we'll say, with voicing chords. There's something that happens with the guitarists as they advance and as they grow where they start voicing their chords differently. And the things that I want to describe in this video, they're never communicated. They're never I never find them taught. I want to share them today. Maybe a lot of advanced guitarists just don't articulate them. So that's what I'm here for today. It's why you uh, like and subscribe to this channel. I've got two uh, concepts I want to present in one video. Concept one is this idea of manipulating the thirds in our chords. When you manip what when you're aware of where your thirds are in your chords and can manipulate them, it can help you to make suspended chords and it can help you to be able to make power chords. And knowing how to do that and to be aware of where those thirds are can make a difference. Um, and, you know, when I talk about power chords, that's going to help you play chords with more distortion. So that's a factor too. If you watched my video on the cage system, I talked about three of those five shapes, D, E, and A shapes. I described them as being what I call a trinity inside cage. They're three chord shapes that are more valuable, that we get more mileage out of than the C and G shapes. One thing, one one of the main reasons why that's the case is because of how they're voiced, and they're voiced in a way where the third note of the chord is, it's the highest note you're fretting. I'm not going to say it's always the highest note. Um, that's not true for like an E shape or an A shape, but um, it's true for this D shape, and I'll start with the D shape as I demonstrate. So the highest note I'm fretting is on that first string and um, it's the F sharp, that's the third. And when you know this trick, in like for the A chord, highest note on fretting is the B string. Let me let you hear these. So D, and then the A, there's my third. And for my E major, there's my third. And I, I tell you that little secret, highest note you're fretting, it just saves you mental processing of having to spell the chords out and then figure out which one's a third. If you're curious, if you don't know enough music theory to know what I mean by the third note, uh, for any chord, we'll take that last E chord I played. Every chord, uh, at least the chord triad, is going to have a one, a three, and a five in them. Major chords, minor chords, diminished and augmented are all chord triads. And that means you're going to have a one, five, a one, a three, and a five in it. And if it's an E chord like this is, the E is the one, and there's a G sharp, which is right there, that's, that, that's the third, and then there's a five, that's a B, which is here in the A string. You can see they're not in order, so you can't just like go from you know lowest to highest and figure out what's the uh, one, three, and a five. That can be true for a C shape and a G shape, by the way. Those chord shapes are in order. There's there's the one, there's the three, the five's open, the open G, then it starts over, a one and a three, okay? So so it, the C shape is voiced that way, and if you play the G shape, you gotta play it with an open B, which I hate this voicing, by the way. <laughs> it's a cowboy voicing for sure, it's a country voicing. Um, like an old style country. That's uh, voice one, three, five, one, three, five, uh, one. Am I right? One, three, five, one, three. No, oh, there's a one on top. So not completely, almost. So I'm glad I questioned that. But for the A, E, and D shapes, 
you know, the one's always the lowest note for these, but I'm telling you how to find the third fast. So once you know where that third is, you can manipulate it. So going back to the, to the D shape, if I was to take this thing, obviously if you flat it, just drop it a half step, that's a D minor. I say obviously, unless you're a beginner. You might, that might be new to you, but for the rest of us, that's a D minor, okay? That, but what, what I'm talking about with manipulating thirds is being able to take that third and raise it to the four and get a D sus, D sus four, and then to open it up, which visually, you kind of visualize it down here. It was here and it drops a whole step. That's a whole step. Because if it drops a half, that's a minor. So drop it a whole step is D sus two. So these chords, they add color, they add tension, they add interest. A sus two can be substituted for a D major. Anytime you have a D major, you can just throw a D sus two in. I'm not saying playing, I'm not saying play it every time, but it's a good option. Okay? And if you want to add some tension, you know, you can add that sus four. It most of the time it's gonna to wanna to, you're gonna to wanna to resolve it to the triad, but don't be too formulaic about this stuff. Nothing wrong with leaving it hanging as well, okay? So there, there's more than one way to play that A, uh, A shape I'm playing. And for E, whoops, <laughs> that was a bad one. Now this one I can't, I can't go lower than that minor, that flat third. So for the E I can't make a sus two that way. I have to make other arrangements for a sus two, like taking a D shape and uh, add that F sharp second position to get an E sus two. Be one way of doing it. There's other ways too, but that's manipulating thirds by moving them up or down as we visualize the D chord. Um, that's manipulate, manipulating, can I say that? Manipulating thirds, and that's one thing you wanna consider, is your options for sus chords. The other thing you can do is take them out altogether. If you take the third out, then, and I'm just not even playing the, the open E, okay? Now where this is useful is for like, um, well, it's it's useful for power chord, what we call a power chord in guitar, is basically a, a, a triad without the fifth in it, okay? Sometimes you'll see that called just, like on a chord chart, it might say D, and in parentheses say no fifth, okay? But guitarists, a lot of times, we we call these power chords. I don't know if other like keyboards call them power chords or not, but one reason I think we call them power chords is because we might be more inclined to play these with distortion, and you hear a lot of clean tones out of me because I want to demonstrate tones. But here's a, some power chords with some distortion. Even though that's an A shape, I'm not playing. I'm not playing the third. It wouldn't sound awful if I played it. it doesn't sound awful at all. Okay. A lot of times we like them without the thirds. Here's that D. We got that F sharp muted. It's not coming through. The first string's muted. One thing about a power chord is they're ambiguous. So. G major works over that G power chord, and G minor. So that's the other thing about taking your thirds out, is you they're ambiguous. You can play major or minor melodies, major or minor scales over them. And you can even go back and forth between the two if you wanted to. Another thing about the power chord I think is useful is sometimes I'll hear something in a song and I'll know, I, it's like, okay, I know it goes to G, but I'm not sure if it's major or minor. I'm not sure, I'll just take that third out, it doesn't matter. I've had this happen sometimes when I'm improvising or 
a song, uh, maybe playing a new song that I, and I just can't remember, like, was this major or minor chord? Sometimes it's a song where, well, I can hear it going major or minor. I'm not sure what the rest of the band's going to do. So if I just take that third out, it doesn't matter what the rest of the band does. It doesn't matter if the vocal harmonies are on that major or minor third. It's going to work either way. I just, it's a trick. You just take the third out and it works. So that's manipulating thirds. So the next concept I want to show you is a concept that I learned from a guitar, actually it's a worship leader uh, by the name of Paul Balash. And he, he's known primarily as a worship leader, but he sings and plays guitar, writes songs. And I, I looked online to see if I could find this concept communicated by better known guitarists, and I haven't found it. And maybe it's parading by a different name. I'm gonna present Paul Balash's concept of what's called train tracks, but I'm also gonna add more detail than he adds. And so even if you're familiar with Paul Balash's concept, stay tuned because I'm going to explain this at a, uh, with more detail than what Paul generally presents with this stuff. But what we're going to, what this is going to do is this is going to give us a neat way to voice our chords. That again, this is stuff that I think is more obvious to advanced players, and they figure it out maybe intuitively without a label like train tracks or without a teaching like I'm going to uh, share with you today. But this will jumpstart you if you're not doing this stuff. And if you are doing this stuff, this will give you a mental framework to think about it and maybe make some new discoveries. And I'll show you some new things, maybe maybe things that are new to you. We'll see. So I'm first going to demonstrate this in the key of E major. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through all seven chords that are diatonic to a key. So in this case, all seven chords in the key of E major. So I'm thinking number system, and I've got another video on the number system that you want to watch if you don't know the number system, because that this is where this is valuable. If you know all your chord options for that are diatonic to a key, it's easier to learn this stuff and process this stuff. So in the key of E major, here's what I'm going to do. Well, let me show you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to like just go play um, like E major and F sharp minor and G sharp minor and A major and B major, and these, I don't know if you hear it, but there's a C sharp minor, and then um, I would do a, um, let's see, I'm trying to think which one I'll do. B over D sharp, okay? I hate, I don't like that one, I hardly ever play it. And I just ran up the numbers, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And by the way, if you watch my number system video, or maybe you, aren't going to watch it, so I should let, just let you know. If you did watch it, you'll know that I, subs, I teach that it's better to play a five over seven instead of a seven diminished. And that's what you saw me do there. I didn't play a D sharp dim, I played a B over D sharp. And the other thing I, t I think I sh shared in that video, if I didn't, I neglected and I'll share it now, is that it's more common uh, with the three minor to substitute it out with a one over three. It's not something I would do as religiously as I do with that, that seven substituted with the five over seven, but it's something that you, uh, you might see me do during this. Uh, so the way I just played those chords, I went through the numbers, but it, they're kind of obtuse sounding. Um, and then I said, okay. What I'm going to do is play them again and this time I'm going to keep my open, my first and second strings open through all my chord voicings. And that's, those first two strings that'll, that'll be ringing, those are our train tracks, okay? So let's hear it. And this really sounds good on acoustic. I should have gotten acoustic out. There's my two chord. I could cover the bass if I want. Whoops. I like to make this a minor seven because it's much easier to finger. And it, but I was trying to be consistent so I made it a triad. But normally I'll just make it a minor seven because I don't feel like there's a lot of difference between the two. And then here's my three, I'm making it a minor seven. I could have tried any, this is not one I would make a one over three over, so maybe I shouldn't have shared that. 
Here's the four. Here, everything's got those open first two strings going. Five. Okay, for six, I'm gonna make it a minor seven. If you remember me talking about my, uh, my uh, what I call it, train, my jet tour of chords, where I gave you a brain dump on chords, I talked about how we can substitute minor triads with minor sub sevenths, you know, just arbitrary, and they're gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna work. So that's what I'm doing, I'm making these minor sevens. And then for number seven, I'm gonna play the five over seven, okay? That one betrays the sound that we just heard, although I could open those two strings up. There we go. That's what I should have done. It's beautiful, okay? Could have also done it like, let's see. Let's see. Nope, that one doesn't work as well. So, but that one's a beauty, okay? And then we're back to, um, now I'm doing an A shape seventh position, keeping those first two strings ringing. <laughs> Let's talk the theory. This is what Balash doesn't cover, and I want to cover this. So, this because this is going to open up doors for us. This is where concepts empower us. The notes that we're letting ring, that's in the key of E, that first string is the first scale degree, and the B, the second string, is the fifth. So, what's really happening with train tracks is that we're letting the first and fifth note of whatever key we're in, we're letting them ring out by voicing them on the top of our chords. That's what we're doing. And the guitar in standard tuning is natural for doing this in a key E major. It's why we love E major so much, okay? Okay, I'm leaving the fifth string open. That's why you don't see me. But this time I'll go to this C sharp minor, okay? This is a great sound. That's enough sharp, but I'm leaving the bass open on E. Here's a little E major, add nine, I love that one. But those first two strings that are ringing, that's the first and fifth note. So I tell you that because that empowers us to try this now in some uh, other keys. So, I mean, obviously you can do a capo and play like you're in key of E major and you can get a lot of mileage, but let's do this in a key of G. And again, a lot of guitarists pick this stuff up without understanding or thinking of it in the train tracks framework that I'm sharing with you today. You might, yeah, I'm sure you've heard a lot of songs do that for G and C, right? The reason that sounds so good is those two notes on top ringing, that's the train tracks. That's the first and the fifth. That's a G and a D in a key of G major. If I went to the five chord, the D, if I suspend it, those two notes can stay on top. Yeah, it'll sound good to resolve it. You don't have to stick train tracks 100% of the time, okay? In fact, you're not going to be able to, but it sounds good. This is one reason why I don't like that G with the open B. Because I'm not getting the full train tracks for key of G major. Look at E minor. That's normally your E minor is like that, right? Um, and I'm just playing it with adding those two tracks. There's, Let's look at, uh, let's, let's go in order. So here's the one major. If I do two minor, I'm at least having the G on top, but if I can get the D on there too, only thing is it starts to sound suspended and I've lost my minor third. So let's go to this, you know, your A minor seven. Let's play it with the G and D on top. That's an A minor 11. Now for chord number three, this is a simpler version. I'll play another one later. G over B. So the B minor, playing a G over B, because if I just played B minor, I'm not going, I'm going to have an F sharp instead of a G on top. That's why one over three is often substituted in, instead of the three minor. So that's what this is, a G over B. We already did four, there's five, I already did six. For chord number seven, train tracks break, okay? 
Although I can really kind of get away with it for that particular shape in this particular key. It's a D sus over F sharp. But there's a potential clash between the F sharp and the G. I get away with it because they're so wide in the range, but sometimes you can't get away with it, so. And not my favorite chord, to be honest. So I oftentimes over seven, when I play a five over seven, I break this, I don't do the train tracks. And then, okay. So that's in the open position for most of those chords. The A minor, I, I went to A minor 11. What if I would do this instead? For, instead of going to this B, G over B, the one over three, I want to do a D shape with the B bass, and I'll take the first string out because I don't have enough fingers. I'm also taking the first string out because these two notes are the train tracks, the, the, the five and the one, the D and the G. So I get this. So I got, so far, I got one major, two minor 11, one over three, I got those pitches on every one of these. So watch what I do for four. As I shift from one over three, not even a shift, just a couple fingers are changing. And this is, I'm keeping that train tracks on top. Technically to do that, my C major triad becomes a C major add nine. That's what that is. Okay, and it's just a beauty. That C major add nine, or, is made basically the rule is over a four chord, throw a major, throw, make it an add nine. That's what this was. It's an add nine. It's not just there's a triad, okay? So that's an add nine. I'm muting the first string or just not playing, I'm not really playing that because I want the train tracks on top. For my five chord, look at this D sus because I want the train tracks on top. Remember earlier we were down here. Now for E minor, I want to keep those two notes on top, so I'm going to make it a minor seven because we know we can substitute minor triads with minor sevens. And leave those two notes on top, and I love this minor seven. I play this one a lot. A lot of times I'll take that note out because, look, now I get vibrato on it, so I give it some attitude to that chord. So that's one through six. And for chord number seven, D over F sharp, here's another one. It's really the same one I did down here when I did G over B. I substituted the G major triad with the G major at nine. That's what that note on the third string is, and I played it at the ninth position. If I take the first string out, well, actually, I mean, I lost, the, I should stop, just say that, again, if you remember what I'd said earlier, five over seven doesn't work so well for train tracks, so I'm not, I don't care about getting those, um, the G and the D in this chord shape as much, okay? So, so I'm breaking it there, okay? But those are train tracks in the key of G. And because so many of these chords are bar and movable, now I'm no longer locked to key of G major. So if I was in a key of B flat, So it's, it's got some gold because those are movable chords and now you're no longer limited to you know, the keys of, C, of E major and G major without a capo, of course. So without a capo, I can take these voicings and I can really move them around and get more mileage. I won't elaborate any further, but you can mess around with part of this concept, like for the key of C, you're not gonna be able to get both train tracks on top, uh, but and I'm calling train tracks the first and the fifth, right? Uh, but you might be able to get one of those two notes on top of your chord voicings as you're moving those chords up and down the number system. So what this concept might be taught or presented as is efficient movement. And pianists, it's, it's probably more obvious on the piano than it is on a guitar. But a pianist will play their chord triads. Um, initially, they'll play all the root, roots, and that means they have to do these wide jumps like we do on guitar, like with bar chords. But quickly, a pianist learns that 
they can just use inversions and they don't have to move their hand as much. They just move some fingers, one or two fingers. And that's an efficiency thing. But it's not just an efficiency. It actually sounds better. We're fortunate enough in music that efficient movement with chords is also oftentimes the best sound. But it's probably more efficient on piano than this guitar, because you, you see me, you know, still having to do a lot of movement. But right here is when I was able to do, you know, keep some static notes in and some static. So it's not quite as, a, efficiency isn't the primary driver, it's not as obvious on the guitar. But the point is that you have common notes and they're ringing on top with your chord and that's what makes the, and if you make your voicings center around them, your chord voicings will sound better for many styles of music. I would not go to this well too much. Sometimes maybe the first and fifth note ringing is just going to cause some ear fatigue and you need to surprise the listener. But it's a great well to go to a lot when you're thirsty. We'll, we'll say it that way. So, hey, if you like the content I provide on this video, if you like the whole idea of conceptual teaching, conceptual learning, please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And I've got more stuff coming. Thank you for watching. Until next time.